Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to a very special episode of the Built on Purpose podcast, where each episode I interview exceptional leaders, entrepreneurs, authors, philosophers, and straight up interesting people to explore their outlook on life, work, and leadership. My hope for our listeners is that you can take away a special nugget of information from each of these interviews, something that will serve you and the people most important to you in pursuing a life built on purpose. My name is Brian Moore co-founder and managing partner of Y Scouts. And today I'm interviewing Patty McCord, principal of Patty McCord Consulting and the former chief talent officer at Netflix. Patty is someone who's truly helping push the boundaries of the way we think about work. She created the famous Netflix culture deck, which Sheryl Sandberg said, may be the most important document to ever come out of Silicon Valley. It's been viewed more than 13 million times on SlideShare. More recently, Patty's been focused on advising innovative companies like Warby Parker, HubSpot, and GitHub, to name a few, about developing culture and leadership. In this interview, we're going to explore culture, we're going to discuss leadership, and we're going to ask Patty all about how we can be innovative when it comes to thinking about work. Here's the interview with Patty. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Patty, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So I want to get right into this and I want to jump into, uh, let's get juicy right out of the gate. And I want to throw out uh, uh, what I hope to be a controversial idea. The idea is built on this foundational thought that people are at the core of every business strategy. In fact, I could say people are strategy. Building on that, when done incredibly well, a company's hiring or recruiting practice or practices shouldn't scale. How does that concept sit with you? Mm, I'm not sure what you mean by scale, but I do have a lot of thoughts on the hiring process. And, you know, I, I thought of something you asked me before we got started with this podcast that that we shouldn't call it human capital or human resources. And at Netflix, I was called the chief talent officer. And so here's how I think about it. It was my job to deeply understand the business of what we were doing and where we were at in the business and what we wanted to accomplish and who we wanted to be, you know, then and when we grew up and, and to kind of work backwards and say, okay, if I'm going to staff this team or I'm going to create a team of people that work together to create and do amazing things, what kind of talent should I have to do that? And so I think that when you start the hiring process with the end in mind, meaning what is the, what does the team need to accomplish? What pace are they going to run at? What's the time frame for doing things? What does amazing look like? Um, what, how do you know if the team is charged up? How can you see people working together? And then you can take that and parse it into individual roles and leadership. Then you're much more likely to hire the right person, but you're hiring the person to achieve amazing stuff in a particular role, not to have the right qualifications in your of experience. So that said, um, why do you think hiring today is done, at least my opinion and what we've seen, and I'm going to guess you're going to agree, for most organizations is done so poorly in this idea that beginning with the end in mind or understanding what problem are we trying to solve, or perhaps better said, when we hire the right person, what set of success outcomes will this person deliver? Why do you think companies yeah. kind of suck at doing that right now? Well, it depends on the size of the company. Let's start out with that. Um, let me let me give you something you may not know about me. I'm a recruiter. That's how, that's my background. And I loved being a recruiter for a couple of reasons. One of them was um, it's quantifiable. I could say, you know, I had this contact with this many people. I did this many phone screens, this many interviews, right? Made this many offers. I liked it a lot. So I could start to pattern recognize when I got it right was one thing. One thing two was as a recruiter, I knew that everyone was replaceable, right? That there was no magic person in every job 
forever. <laughs> that eventually people go, move in and out of their careers. And I loved it when people left the company because that gave me a new job to hire for. And the third thing was, I really loved getting deep inside of what people love to do. And when I started thinking about that, and actually my fraternal twins helped me do that a lot, every po person is motivated really differently and they're driven really differently. And the matchmaking of trying to achieve that thing coupled with learning and understanding what people do is the magic of, of really good talent matching. But you know, it's a discipline that involves digging deep into both sides of the equation. You know, we just talked briefly about really, really knowing of what success looks like. And the other thing is the ability to really dig deep into what kind of work that people love to do. And I think where we went wrong was we turned it, in, at least internally in most large companies, into a butts and seats, fill the requisition, check off the tick boxes. Um, you know, for example, I always had to fight against the cost per hire metrics or the time to hire metrics. I'm like, I don't care how long it takes to get the right person. <laughs> you know, if we find them tomorrow, great. If we find them in six months, then that's what it's going to take to find the right person. Sure. And I always knew when my recruiting team was doing a good job, I always sat with them because I liked the energy, was when I would hear one of my recruiters say to a hiring manager, he's not good enough. You got to give me more time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, don't settle. You've got a big, you've got a big problem to solve, and this person's just adequate. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, the, I think the, the the butts and seats and the speed to fill or time to fill in some of these metrics. Uh, getting back to the uh, the initial question around scale, you know, I think what yeah. has what what has ended up happening is at least you know mid to larger sized organizations as as the level of complexity grows that they begin to lose sight of what matters most. And so they treat hiring and recruiting as simply another process that when you check off the boxes yeah, yeah, and you yeah, adhere yeah. To, right. to a certain set of metrics, that that's where success lies. And I think, you know, people, are, you, you said it best, you have fraternal twins. We talked about it before we got this podcast going, you know, your two twins are incredibly different and so is everybody yeah. in our organizations and so yeah can yeah. we really scale when all of the jobs that we're hiring for are so incredibly unique by and large here's a way i think we can though here's a tool that we have now that we didn't have when i started out in business that i think is magic so when i used to uh, when i was a recruiter and i was recruiting, recruiting for technical people i would go to whatever um you know weird asian restaurant du jour was their favorite you know it's an afghani restaurant in the corner of the strip mall sure and you know how in restaurants they used to have like the fishbowl on the counter yeah when you walk in you put you your, business your business card, card. In yeah. Some, <laughs> yeah yeah you get a free lunch sure. well i just grab i just grab the fishbowl <laughs> you go to like <laughs> the back corner you know and i dump it out and the way would come over and say, you know, start fretting. I'm like, it's fine. It's good. You know, bring me that die. <laughs> and I tell people, I'm like, but see, I don't have to do that anymore because God gave us LinkedIn. This is so true. And so, and I think that the difference now, like to, to combine what you're saying with what I'm saying is we have these networks of connections now that used to be the exclusive network of recruiters. Right. And almost everybody knows someone who knows the right person for the next hire is. And it's that ability to work with recruiters, not turn the job over to recruiters. You know, I think the most successful ways to hire are true partnerships. And that's where I get frustrated with my startups sometimes. They're like, oh, yeah, I got seven headhunting firms. They all do a good job. I'm like, you can't do a good job with seven different firms are working on the same job. Absolutely not. You know, that's just crazy shit. And, you know, how do you know the level, you know, this, you need somebody who's going to help you get the, you know, the hoof work done, but somebody who deeply is going to sit with you deeply and understand what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, the role for all of us in the, I think, um, whoever's hiring, if it's the board, if it's the executive team, if it's just a hiring manager, the way we really make this a better, more efficient, more effective experience is we say it's a 50-50 relationship between whoever's recruiting and whoever's hiring. 
True partnership. True right. partnership. True partnership. And their job to start with is to back to how we started. If they can't describe what success looks like, then you're just going to fill the job. No, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's a great segue. So, so obviously a, a critical part of this entire process is the interview. And mm -hmm. I, I think interviews today, by and large, have, have become somewhat of a joke, right? Where we, we companies are running ads, they're using all this mm -hmm. new, newfound space on on job postings that weren't previously available mm -hmm. in newspaper ads, and they're they're droning on and on about all the minutia of what the job's going to do, which doesn't look like success. Mm -hmm. It looks like a list of tasks and responsibilities. And it describes the day you start. Right. And and here's right. all of the skills and experience and the 78 things you need to actually have to be considered viable. So the recruiter doesn't have to spend their time looking at the wrong resumes. And then the, the interview takes place. And we're magically shocked as interviewers that, oh, wow, these candidates are telling us all the right things. Well, you've given them everything in the job posting of what to say. So right. they, they have half a brain. <laughs> They're going to tell you, you know, what you've told them to say. How do we actually get to some level of authenticity? I think it's missing completely. I say that interviewing is like painting. It's all in the prep, right? Elaborate if you, if on you that. do it, if you, so it, so we already started with step one. What does success in the role look like? Yeah. So here's Patty's backwards recipe for success, and I I teach this to turn to tide how to get rid of somebody, how to hire somebody, you know, how to work with people, right? So first you start with a time frame. I usually say six months to a year, depending on the level of the role. And if that person, if we hired the right person in that role and things were amazing, like we all stepped back and said, oh my God, did we do the right thing? What would be occurring then that's not occurring now? Yep. And so then I tell people to throw out all their metrics, you know, well, the product's going to run this much faster. We're going to have this much more revenue. We're going to have this many more um, business models that are accurate, whatever it is, right? And everybody has numerals. So give me, give me all those metrics, spit them all out to me. And then I say, make a movie of it. So if I'm walking around, are there more meetings? Are there less meetings? Is there somebody who's willing to take a stand and make a hard decision where now everybody sort of points fingers at each other? Are people heads down? You know, are they working collaboratively or are they leading strong? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And that gives you the behaviors and the drive and the motivation and, you know, right, what somebody wants to get engaged in with purposeful work. So now I know that, I got the movie, I got my metrics. Now I drop down and say, okay, well, in order for those things to happen that are happening now, what would somebody need to know how to do? And so now you get at a skill set that's never on the job description. They need to be a really good negotiator. Or they need to have a knockdown, drag out technical fight and win and be happy about it. Mm -hmm. Or they need to quietly influence a lot of people who aren't extroverted. Or, right? I mean, Absolutely. All those things you'd need to know how to do. Maybe they need to know to work, how to work at 5, 10, 20x scale from where we're at right now. Yep. Right? Yep. And, and scale and complexity are often things that you look for, but you don't describe it that way. You say 10 to 15 years and progressively increasing roles of responsibility. Right. And that's not really what you want. Nope. You want to know somebody who's going to go, oh, man. I got to tell you, at 100x, this is a really different picture. Mm -hmm. Okay? So yep. now we know what they need to know how to do. Then you drop down and say, well, what kind of skills and experience would lead somebody to know how to do that? And the reason I like this reverse thinking is because most people write job openings to describe A, the person who left that they didn't want to leave mm -hmm. be the fantasy person that doesn't exist yep. or see whatever it will take to get the wreck approved. <laughs> <laughs> Fill in the blank. Right. right? Strike whatever, one, strike two, strike three. Going to say yes to. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, in, and instead, if I do this and so now I've worked down to now I'm going to have, have much more open mind to diversity of thought 
to the, because that in my A example, I'm going to describe somebody who's just like me. That's how we end up in the companies that look like they are. Yep. Yep. Like, like right? attracts like, because right? Yep. Like attracts. I'm going to need somebody who's really smart, really good with the numbers, really influent somebody just like me. Yep. Right. Yep. So now I've worked myself back backwards and there's one more part I want to tell you, which is, okay, now I know what we're trying to achieve. Now I know what it's going to take to do it. Now I know what you need to know how to do now I know the skills and experience that would lead me there and then and only then take a look at the team and see who you have got mm -hmm. because the deltas is what you hire for yep yep I right so now think how rich of a job description I have <laughs> you know I I go into my startups all the time I'm like oh will you throw this piece of <laughs> app away you're you're hiring a head of product they want to know what nasty, gnarly, badass, cross-functional problem they're going to solve. Totally. Right? They don't want to know what their tasks are going to be. At a VP level, I'm thinking they probably know. Yeah, and if they don't, you shouldn't be hiring them in the first place. Or, you know, sometimes you actually turn off people with those job descriptions, Absolutely. particularly if they're written for, like, the person who left. Yep. It's like, you know, you, then you're not open to somebody going, nah, I'd never do it that way. But here's how I'd tackle that problem. And then, you know, those wonderful interviews you have where you go, get out. I would have never, never thought of that. Well, and it creates ownership, right? If you leave the door open enough to where you're describing a picture of success but not giving someone the instruction manual of how to achieve it, and that candidate really <laughs> leans into, oh, okay, yeah, I yeah. see what you're trying to get yeah. at. Here's how I would do yeah. it. Brian, you know, I'm such a storyteller. I got to tell you another story. Please. I was, we, I, was at, I was at Netflix and we were moving into our um, device space. And at the time, the devices consisted of um, DVD players that you could stream from or the be very beginning of smart TVs. Most people were streaming on their laptop. Uh, and, and we had a fantasy that maybe someday we'd do games. So I was interviewing this guy from Motorola, and the whole time I was talking, he kept flipping open his phone, right? He, kept, he couldn't stop fiddling with his, his phone. We called them phones back then, right? Cell phones. <laughs> right. And, and I said, I said, what are you doing? And he goes, you know, we're going to watch video on these. And I'm like, yes, I know we're not. And he goes, yeah, we are. We are. And I'm like, who's going to watch video on their phone? He's like, it's going to be different. It's going to be, we're going to hold it in our hand. I promise you this, Patty. And so we go through the, the interview, and I'm like, you're obsessed with this, aren't you? And he goes, yeah, I am. And I'm like, you know what? Stay in touch, okay? Because if it comes true, then I want you. But I don't want you now to drag you back to the world of the PC. Uh, right? yeah, I'm like, uh, you don't really, really want to work on a laptop, do you? And he's like, you know, he's clutching this little thing. <laughs> 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 and... You know, hired him when we did mobile. He led our um, iPod, our iPad integration years later. I love it. I love it. But that it, takes but, such, what a, it's so much like you're a skilled observer, right? To be able to see how he was interacting with his mobile device and, and to recognize that by you. Look, I, I have no doubt he probably had the skills and abilities and experience to thrive. Working oh, totally. Out. Yeah, you right. Know, my whole my technical team was like, well, you talked him out of it. What are you crazy? Like, are you crazy? Right. But that's where we come in because those are the patterns we recognize when we do nothing but interview. Yep. Right. I mean, and that's the the body language and the pattern recognition. My CFO told me one time, he's like, you know, you're kind of a diva on recruiting. And I'm like, you know, I really love when you flatter me because it's only happened twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if, you're, if you're going to be a diva at any, be a diva at, at controlling <laughs> who gets to come into the well, organization. <laughs> You know, he's, he's like, you know, you have this gift. And I'm like, nah, it's the same gift you have. It's just pattern recognition. You just do yours with numeral. It's great. Right? I, I do mine with, I just pay attention to what. And I think the other thing, we, so, so, so let's go back to the prep on interviewing. So you got to do the, 
that hard work first of defining the problem to be solved and the time frame to do it and what success looks like, right? Yep, yep. And then I think you have to be extraordinarily disciplined about putting together the interview team, putting together the phone screen, figuring out what's going to happen in what order, what the time frame's going to be, who's going to follow up with who. I, I put interview teams in a room and I'm like, okay, so now we know what we're trying to achieve. What are you going to ask? What are you going to ask? What are you going to ask? What are you going to cover? You know, and I have to teach them how that we who do this a lot is like, you know, you can do an entire interview with one question, just that, you know, behavioral pulling the thread, but I'm like, don't pull the thread on. So I do not want this person to come in and have seven different people go over their resume. But I really don't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want one person to go over and find out if what they said on their resume is true. Right. So really, you're you're responsible for delivering this product. Wow, Brian, that's impressive. That's a huge product at your company. So you were you were a part of a team, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. Um, and you were the leader of the team. Were you the I'm, help me understand? No, I was an individual contributor. And how many contributors were on? Oh, Four hundred. Okay, so sole. <laughs> Solely mm -hmm. responsible. Right. <laughs> right. Not so much. This is somewhat of a stretch. Right. I mean, solely responsible <laughs> for your one four hundred. Right. But, you know, now oh, that's helpful to know. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. In, instead of, you know, what are you proud of and what are your strengths and weaknesses or what are your. So um, so I think in the other the other person I always want on an interview team is. Um, someone who has a track record of hiring great people in the company. Mm. How do you identify that? And I, Is that simply a matter of looking it, at the people that they've been responsible for identifying in the yep. past? Okay. Yep. Yep. You know, when you step back, all of a sudden you go, you know what? Out of the directors we have over the last five, you know, five direct, really successful directors, four of them were hired by this one person. Mm-hmm. Right. And three of them moved in. Three of them are actually not in the jobs she hired them for. But there and, you know, I remember this person I had was a marketing person and the engineers would go, uh, I don't think I need to talk to the marketing person. I'm like, oh, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, they'd come out and say, what was her heart? What was your hardest interview? She's like, God, that marketing. <laughs> 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 she, are you sure she can't write code? I'm like, she may be, maybe she can. I don't know. She certainly appreciates what you guys do. Right. And then, um, and then I, so my rules were, if you contacted somebody on the phone, you had to get back to them with the, what the next step was going to be in 48 hours. If they came in in person, it was 24. If it was a phone screen in the middle of the phone screen, you knew it was wrong. You said goodbye. Didn't waste people's time. Same thing with on-site interviews. If you know you scheduled them for a whole day and halfway through, you're like, this is never going to work. My guy, you know, my mold. I'm like, should we just call this a day and I'll call you back in a couple of years? Yeah, why why waste everyone's time if you know it's not going to you know, be right? You know, why don't yeah. you go pick up your kids at school? Right? Yeah, totally. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, is this a good outcome? I'm like, it's a great outcome. Yeah, we're great. Gonna, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, but then the other part is the at the end of the interview process, and and when I I did this internally, but I th certainly think you can do it as an external person, which is get everybody in the room and say, what'd you think of this person? And you know how people give them the thumbs up or thumbs down or on a scale of one to 10. Then I always followed that up with, oh, you liked him a lot. Love the guy, love them. Like, um, what what do you want to do? Have a beer with them. I'm like, okay, <laughs> what, question did, what question did you ask? What answer did he give that made you love him? He likes the same kind of beer as I do. And yeah, no, listen, I do startups all the time. And this culture fit, you know, you've heard the, uh, you've heard the adage of the, the woman in um, San Francisco and the San Francisco startup world who's telling her friend, she's like, yeah, you know, this company called me and I went over there and like had beers with them. And then we went out to lunch at pizza. And then the other night we played pool. And I'm still wondering whether they're going to, you know, invite me in for an interview. And her friend goes, girl, you're in third round. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's frightening if that's the way it's really happening. Oh, you know, they're 26. Right. I mean, you know, one guy told me, he's like, all oh, hundred percent of our startups are, we have the best employees in the, because everybody's a referral. And I'm like, 
get out. Really? You hired 150 people that are referrals. I'm like, you guys are 25 years old. So half of these people were met at the bar after the third right, year. You know right, that. right, right. Right. I mean, they don't have that many friends. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't know what good looks like. I mean, it's okay. There it seems like a nice group of folks, but I'm telling you, they are not the best people. Has that been perhaps one of the most surprising things for you as you've been working with some of these small, uh, smaller and, and mid-sized startups uh, that they just, they really, they don't have their sea legs underneath them when it comes to really being able to identify what great talent looks like? It's, well, yes, of course, but, you know, that comes with experience sure. and sometimes talent has, to, you know, you have to see bad talent before you see good talent. Sure. And, you know, I tell people that once you exercise that muscle, you get better and better at it, right? You got to, you got to hire, you know, the, it's got to be a muscle in your company though. It's the most effective muscle you have because nobody will get rid of anybody who's mediocre unless they're confident they can hire somebody better. And you always can. Always. Right. Um, it's more about for them. It's more about structure and discipline because they want to be so cool and easy about everything. And they overdo all the wrong things, in my opinion. So I, you know, how I approach them usually is I most of them are geeks. And I say, is this how you write code? You just sort of sit down and start like typing in some numerals. <laughs> No, you know, you have a process and you, you know, think about what you want to do. And so I introduced them to a little bit of structure around it. So, which always surprised them. They think I, I'm just going to tell them to like feel it. Mm. And, and sometimes they, they're better at talking to people. They just don't know how to evaluate. And that's why, that's why it's so important to teach the begin with the end in mind. Yep. So now we've got all kinds of information about this person and you really like them and you're in depth on them. But can we go back to what we said we wanted them to do? I want to, I want to get back to this gentleman who, uh, the Motorola guy who was playing with his, my Motorola guy. Yeah. He had his knife too. He was clutching his, his, his mobile device in the absence yeah. of being able to read, let's say a nonverbal cue like that, which you clearly saw during the interview process. For, for those out there who are trying to find people that are aligned to what the work is doing, the difference in the world that the work is making, you know, call it the meaning, call it yep. the purpose. What advice yep. could you give or would you give to CEOs out there, whether they're big, you know, CEOs of big companies, midsize, small, doesn't matter. How, how can you really understand whether or not someone's going to thrive because the work matters to them? I think it's a little bit of digging into what's motivated and demotivated people in the past, okay. but asking about it in a different way. So my algorithm for success, I have to say words like algorithm because I worked with engineers for so long, <laughs> goes like this, is what you love to do that you're extraordinarily good at doing something we need someone to be great at. So we need to know what great at is. Yep. And you know, like if somebody can do the job, but they're not great at it and they don't love it, then you, they always just kind of piss you off. Yep. It's like, God, I wish he was more into it. I wish he was better. Right. And if you're passionate about something, my Motorola guy, right? If you're passionate about something and the company doesn't care, then you're always frustrated. It's like, why don't you care? You don't even know that, that I, I can do these amazing things. It's like, I know you can do those amazing things. I just don't care. Right. I just don't need you to. So the question I ask sometimes is, you know, at the end of the day, when you get in your, wherever you commute from, you know, the subway or your car or whatever, and you, the doors close and you're all alone and you go, today was a great day at work. Today was amazing. What what happened? Yeah, what'd you do? What'd you do that day? Yep, right? What, yep. and it, or or, the or maybe what you didn't like, you what didn't you do that day too? Right? Like sometimes same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Understanding yeah, what like, it is that brings I, people down. And I down. do a lot of, especially at the executive level, I do a lot of probing into like failure because we all have it. I mean, you don't get to an executive level without screwing up a bunch, right? Absolutely. And so like, and, and what would you, if you had to do it differently, what would you do? 
because then because that's really important at the executive level it's not what somebody knows but how they got to the knowing yep absolutely right that's mature and that's the thing i think i think for ceos you know the the deep driving traits you want in really dedicated leaders is um really good judgment is the number one skill right the ability to make the right call and that doesn't show up in on whatever a resume, on a resume judgment is is rarely no. a, a, an accomplishment on a resume good decision making right i mean these are things that really require deep digging yeah yeah or 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 much more commonly at the executive level there are three right answers mm -hmm. And all three of them have merit <laughs> and all three of them have validity and all three of them have data and all three of them have, you know, preconceived outcomes. Right. And most many, much of the time as an executive, you just pick one. Right. That's all you can do, especially if you're in an, in a company full of innovation. Yep. Do the best you, you know, can. When you, you know, I used, you I used to tell people at Netflix all the time, they'd say, why didn't management see this coming? I'm like, well, we make this shit up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were just wrong. Yeah. But you, but you, you but know, you made we, a decision. Yeah, you have to make a decision, and and then then the other part of leadership is to go, you know, hey, I got to go. As it's as important to go back and tell the team, here's here's the data I had going into the decision, and here's what I was wrong about. Yep. So the context, right? Behind and it. that, yeah, the context behind it, and that's what creates good judgment. Yep. So speaking of CEOs, right? and and the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I was just. No, I was just going to say. The important part of the judgment is communicating the, hey, by the way, I made a mistake and I'm okay with that. Absolutely. Well, that's a tremendous amount of humility then, right? And that just engenders trust with uh, with the people that you're working yep. with. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. So I read in a recent interview, um, and this was specific about a comment you made in advising some startup CEOs, that you think it's wise for them to be interviewing at least three times mm -hmm. a week. Uh, for mm -hmm. roles and and really being mm -hmm. active in building their networks, can you elaborate on the importance of the the CEOs spending their time doing the interviewing? Well, first of all, it's, it's practice, and um, a lot of them, as first time CEOs, are are come from another branch of the company. They're marketing people, they're engineering people, they have an expertise in a particular area. And so they learn an inordinate amount by interviewing and talking to people from all the different functions in the company. Again, right, you know, you think a CFO when you're a 30 year founder CEO is just a guy who does accounting, a CFO, right? And you don't realize until you talk to a great CFO, oh gosh, we've n I've never even thought of modeling the business out five years. Huh. Hmm. There's an idea. <laughs> I've never, I've never looked at trend analysis. Huh? You can do that. Huh? <laughs> oh, wow. An IP, an IPO, right? A public company operates differently. How? Whoa. Mm. I need somebody to help me think about that. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. The second part of it is it, it's a tremendous signal to the organization that finding the right people is important. So, you know, I tend to work with start smaller companies who are going to be bigger companies someday. So I spend a lot of time trying to talk them out of the nostalgia of, you know, we've created a culture and we don't want it to change. I'm like, okay, so just so you know, there are no inordinately successful 50 person startups in the world. Right. Just so you know, right. You know, Facebook is what, 10,000? Culture is <laughs> good. So, so just if, yeah. It's going to so change. You're gonna, it's going to it's going to change, Absolutely. right? And, oh, by the way, we all grow up in a change. So, so what you want to do is be the steward of that change. And you want to be able to recognize when things, it's time to change. And when the team that you have may not have the horsepower for the company you're going to become. Yep. And that as CEO, you own that. You own that. Nobody else. The recruiters don't own it. HR doesn't own it. You own that. You own putting together the right team to get done what you believe that the company can achieve. Yep. 
And so I, that I think the message that it sends that this person relentlessly seeks talent makes people and people imprint on their CEOs. Yep. Absolutely. So, so you know, when you, when you have a company that's hungry for change and is always reaching out in those networks, then whoever steps in to help make the discipline of hiring the right person can tap into all those networks that we didn't have before. Yep. Yeah. We've, we've, right? said, you would, you would say, we would say to ourselves, remember that guy, like at that company or that worked with that woman that like, really helpful patty well and that's the uh that's, that's the beauty of the technology that we have at our fingertips right if you're willing to work hard enough everybody on the planet is now findable exactly i mean i was at a, a ceo uh round table not too long ago and somebody you know the, the, you know i understand it's really hard to hire good technical people and i'm like well here's <laughs> here's a tip so just hire women for the next year. You'll you try that, you know, fish in a smaller pond. I don't think you understand qualified women don't cross my desk. I'm like, qualified men are walking across your desk. <laughs> like, take a piece of paper and go out. What do you have? 175 people in your company. So ask each person, literally each person, who's the best woman they've ever worked with and interview them all. There's 175 candidates just like that. There's just like that. Yep. Right. Yep. And trust me, there's at least a hire in there. Yep. yep. But now you know what your interview list is for the next couple of months, 175 women. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, when you interview them, ask them the same questions. And then when you're 350 people, then you don't go, oh, we don't have diversity. Let's, let's talk about that for a second. Let, in the businesses yep. you're, you're advising right now, I'm curious. How many or what percentage, roughly, I don't expect exact numbers, but what percentage of either the CEOs or just the overall leadership teams uh, are female? Oh, it's woefully small out here. W why? It's, why it's, are we missing the market on that so badly? You know, we, we've got another podcast. In this conversation, <laughs> my uh, but there's so much like that's hires, out there that, that shows like it. Hires like the VC, the VCs in the Valley are all white men and they have that, you know, they, when they say, Hey, look, you know, we'll hire qualified women, but we're not going to lower our bar. They mean that. Huh. They mean that a white guy or an Asian guy with a degree from Stanford, who's, you know, connected to all of the other VCs is better qualified than a woman who's worked her way up. They believe that to be true. Yeah, like attracts like because when they look because when they look around in their world and they see who's like them that's successful, they're all like them. Yeah, are they not paying attention so, to all of the data and the stories and just the amount of attention that they are they are, they are, but they don't see it. They don't see it. That's sad. It's I mean, a, it's they a missed don't. opportunity. It's, you know, I can only get to them. I, I, one more story. So I'm talking about pay inequality, and I happened to be talking to this group of CTOs. It was like Fortune 50 CTOs. Yeah. And at the end of the convers at the end of the talk, I'm up on stage. I'm like, hey, by the way, now that I know who you guys are and you know me a little bit, we, can you just go back to your companies and have your HR people run you a spreadsheet of all the job titles in your organizations and then give me median salary by male and female? And if there's a discrepancy, write a check and fix it. Okay, because I know you guys are writing checks for software licenses that are going that you'll never use. Sure, <laughs> they're going to way outstrip the, the need to fix this problem. And then you can figure out why you got there. But could you just level the playing field, okay, for me? Can you guys all do that? So afterwards, I'm doing this cocktail thing, and this guy comes up to me and he goes, "You know, Patty, I'm a executive senior vice president at my large corporation." I'm like, "Well, congratulations!" And he says, "You know, and the reason I got there is because I'm very fiscally responsible. You know, I've always been great at saving money and doing the right thing in terms of dollars spent in the company. And you're asking me to do something that doesn't make any sense for my business." I said, hmm, how so? And he said, well, you know, if I have a woman who's making 130 and um, she'll come for 140 and a man who's making 150 and he'll come for 160, you're telling me I should just pay her 160. And I'm like, that's what the job's worth. And he goes, I know, but, you know, 
I'm going to shell out what another 30 K and the, of my company's money. And I said, huh, I going to react when your daughter comes home and tells you this story. Oh, 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 oh. what was his reaction? And he goes, and he says, he's, he's like, it, it's squeaking out of his voice. He goes, it'll be fixed by then. I'm like, yeah, really? <laughs> Who's going to fix it? That's right. why it's not fixed now. Yeah. Who's going to fix it? I have two daughters. Who's, uh, you know, that, that, yeah, I'm that, telling you, that's bullshit. Listen, I've got, two, you know, I have two daughters too, and I'm a raging feminist. I've been working on this for 30 years and it's worse. You know, I'm going to go as far as to say that I'm a raging feminist too, because I think yeah, the future well, of leadership demands do something about it, right? Don't, female qualities, don't any slate of candidates to any company that doesn't include women. Yeah. I mean, that's as recruiters, this is our job. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, okay, if you look at the most female um, penetrated organizations in any company, they are three, marketing, HR, and finance. Women own two of them and we can't fix pay. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. I mean, it's because, <laughs> because, you will get, as I have gotten on my performance reviews since the beginning of time, <laughs> she's kind of pushy, a little bit shrill. Mm, but it's okay when a man is pushy. It's not straight considered poking, pushy. Straight, yeah. she's, she's straight talker, but kind of bitchy. Mm -hmm. Double standard. I mean, it's completely a double standard. It always has been. Yep. And, um, and, you know, I think b Bravo... Bravo to a the geeky women out here who have broken open the let's just take a look at the numbers the data doesn't lie, and then the people willing to tell the stories about you know here's what it's like to be inside and the women who say I give up I'm going to marketing I make better money I don't have to deal with this stuff. Yep. Well, it sounds like there's nothing right. but a huge opportunity, huge opportunity. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, yep. and it's not just a huge opportunity to make things right for women, which I would love to be my jihad, but no, it's, gonna it's a huge it's opportunity. Yeah. Well, we don't, you know, by the way, we're heading into a talent gap that's enormous, right? I mean, we have two populations in the workforce right now. You know, there's some, there's a sprinkling in the middle, but there's, you know, the people coming up in their 20s and the people in their 50s and 60s. Yep, absolutely. And eventually the people in the 50s and 60s are going to be like me and go, oh, I still want to work. I just don't want to go to work every day. Right. Right. And somebody's got to be there thinking of the new ideas and all that kind of stuff. And I'm telling you, people like my marine biologist's daughter would rather work in a coffee shop than work for a tech company. Yep. It's got to change. Yeah. So, but you know, to, to kind of round up to why you're calling me and what you do for a living. Um, it's just flow, man, <laughs> woman. It's just, we've just got to present and that, and that's why I'm saying if you start with how this, the, the problem you want to solve and you're open to different ways of doing it and you encounter different types of problem solving in the interview process, you're much more likely to give somebody a chance. Yep. Well, and not to mention, I think you, know, you talk about leadership and, and we, we still think of leadership. I think this industrial revolution hangover that we are all suffering from by and large sweeping generalization, that leadership uh, of the future looks entirely different than leadership of the past and empathy and collaboration and teamwork and finding win-win solutions um, uh, is what it's going to take. And frankly, it is. And I, I see that everywhere. I see, you know, we can't, it's, first of all, it hasn't been that way for decades. We just haven't renamed it. Yep. We haven't, we haven't so those it. silos of like, you know, the marketing people don't talk to the engineering people don't talk to the manufacturer. You know, the thing about the internet, that there's a, a bunch of things, but the, the connections that I see that are profoundly different than they were a decade ago or two decades ago, A, the connection with your customer is, is vital and it's constant and it's real and it's real time. So you try something, it's like, oh, they hated that. Okay, we got to rethink that. Sure. 
And there's there's no solution for the products and services we're doing now that you can't, you know, test your way into it. And they're all collaborative. It's like, oh wow, you know, if 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 we're not marketing what we're building, <laughs> that's kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. We can see it, right? So the information flow has allowed that connectivity between employees and the customers in a way we've never seen before. And and I think that's the great part that we should all be tapping in, large and small. The second the second trend that I see that is starting to make even the big companies start to fret a, a lot because they're asking me to come speak to them is, wow, everything's going really fast here. Now, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. and, and those layers of bureaucracy and hierarchy, you know, you, you can't. You can't go fast if you got to ask for three levels of approval. Nope, that's not. It's uh, you know you add you add two days to every single process. You know you go to a little company. It's like I did it. Yep. <laughs> but they know they understand what the other teams are trying to do, so that the collaboration isn't just an an interesting and more fun way to work. It's how we ha our work have to work now. Yep. It's the only way to get things right. done so, quickly enough to keep up with, yeah. with the world around yeah. us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Patty. I can't thank you enough. I have uh, just one more just quick question. Um, if okay. You're advising some real and working with some really cool companies right now. And, and, and at the risk of making you pick one, is there anyone particular that is just sort of blowing your skirt up right now? Oh, you know, it's like your kids, you love them all in a different way. <laughs> and just like your kids, at some of them you're like, okay, just I'm not I'm not talking to you until you grow up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will say to very, very small CEOs who are like, Can you come and hang out with me? I'm like, nah, yeah. you need to go to for a couple of years and call me back. <laughs> you know, if you're if you're still alive. Um, I do a lot of work with Warby Parker and I love them a lot. Um they're the glasses online glasses company in New York. Oh, sure, sure. And and uh, when I first met the Warby guys, they were telling me about their secret strategy to open stores. You know, I come from Netflix, where we defeated Block, Blockbuster, right? I'm like, aren't you going the wrong way? Right. <laughs> Brick and mortar stores, really, really? Why would you really? want to do that? I don't know anything about that. <laughs> and what Warby has that is something that was new to me was. Um, they tap into this zeitgeist of, of coolness that everybody can access. And it's just this magic that they have. You know, that company started just virally. The first time I visited them, they're in this crappy building in New York City. The first floor is a Benjamin Moore paint store. It was this dingy lobby, and I'm like, hey, to the, you know, the elevator guy, where's Ward New Park? He's like, I don't know. You're in New York. <laughs> Figure it out. Figure it out. <laughs> so I go up and, and it's this, you know, warehouse of a floor with like concrete floors and, you know, people are just working off of folding tables. And in the corner is this sort of makeshift store and it's packed and there's no signage, right? It's just all that everybody knows, mouth. everybody, it's all word of mouth, wow. right? It's all social networking. It's, you know, the same as the food trucks in Austin, right? <laughs> You, you find out where the cool ones are. And, and I was like, really, you want to open stores? Look at this, what you have is magic. Yeah. But they, but it's a different, you know, it's very, di so it's New York, it's retail, it's fashion. Yeah. You know, that sixth sense about what people are going to love is, re is a really different thing than my Silicon Valley, you know, here's what the geeks data tells them. So there's a nice right brain, left brain combo going on now too, and in particularly in retail. So that part is really fun. That's so really I, cool. I love them. I mean, they have lots of struggles. Um, it's not easy to open stores all over the country. It's not easy to figure out you can't have customer service in the building next to you in Manhattan. <laughs> you know, great challenge. Not easy to, to great. yeah. Yeah, great challenges yeah. to solve. I love it. I love yeah, it. yeah. Well, this has been great, Patty. Again, I cannot thank you enough. For, for those of you out there, the CEOs and leaders out there who want to learn more about Patty and get in touch with Patty, you can visit her site at pattymccordconsulting.com. 
Again, that's pattymccordconsulting.com. Patty, what a wonderful hour we've spent with you. I cannot thank you enough. Have an awesome, awesome 2016. You bet. Talk to you soon, Brian. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thanks for listening, folks. You can obtain a transcribed version of this show and hear more interviews from the Built on Purpose podcast by visiting our website, yscouts.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, I have two things for you. Number one, I'm hoping to get some bonus questions answered by Patty from our community. So if you have any questions you'd like Patty to answer, drop me a line at brian at yscouts.com and I will forward on your question. A couple of additional episodes I think you'll greatly enjoy. One, Michelle Geelan, author of Broadcasting Happiness, The Science of Igniting and Sustaining Positive Change, talks to us about the impact we all have on one another related to what and how we broadcast our messages. In another, Louis Efron, author of How to Find a Job, Career, and Life You Love, talks to us about the power of purpose and how asking the right questions will lead you to a life of meaning and purpose. Once again, that URL is yscouts.com forward slash podcasts. Until next time, thanks for listening.